church. So if you're visiting with us uh, today, please nudge the person brought you because there are notes to the sermon. It's got little pr- pretty pictures of maps in it this week. Um, so, uh, and we're obviously continuing on the heroes in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11. And I'm excited about this because sometimes you feel like you know a story and then you really get into it and you go, I don't know this one at all. Um, and that's what it feels like a bit with studying Abraham. And he's in uh, Hebrews 11 a couple of times, but this is the first time he's in there. And so the title of today's sermon is Abraham, Faith to Respond to God's Call. So we're uh, starting in Hebrews 11, verse 8. It says, By faith, when Abraham called, when, when called to go to a place where he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And then in the notes, there's a little map to actually show you how far Abraham went. It was a long way. Let me just say that. A difficult terrain, a difficult place. Looks like there were swamps, marshes, mosquitoes. Yes, Abraham ran a marathon. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Just had to be fitted in there somewhere. Okay, so Abraham, putting it a little into context, Abraham was a son of Terah and was brought up in a city of Ur of the Chaldeans. This is actually a place that um, has been found. And actually, as a young boy, I used to play this game was a little bit like drafts that was found in the ruins there with my mum. She was all excited about it. I didn't know what it was about. She was religious. I wasn't at the time, but now I know what it was all about. But we go back to Genesis 11:27, 27, and we read the account of him. It says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, that's Abraham later, Nahor and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans. In the land of his birth, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was a daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. So a place where they grew up, Ur of the Chaldees, was a place where they worshipped false gods. We know that in Joshua 24, 2. Ur was also a place of Terah's pain. His son had died there. And we know that that would be a difficult thing. I love the quote from Lord of the Rings, where the king of of Rohan, he says, no man should have to bury his son. It goes against the order of things. You know, Terah, the father of Abram, who again later has become Abraham, set off for the promised land. He was done with this great city of Ur, done with worshipping false gods. I think because he went, you know what, this is a place when things go bad. We've got gods, but these gods don't work. So he gathers everybody off for a better life, and he goes, I'm going to go to the land of Canaan, which we will later know as the promised land. Some believe that it was he, not Abraham, who first had the calling to actually go to Canaan, because that's where he was being set off for. And also because in Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed the Lord and it credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. So not only was God referring, hey, I I called you when you were in Ur, And then we have this account where he goes, well, his father had this plan to go to Canaan. So put the two together and it seems like God actually chose his father to actually go to the promised land. And yet along the way, Terah got comfortable and he settled halfway in between the pain of his past and the promise of paradise that lay ahead. Let me ask you, is that where you are today? Halfway between the pain of the past and what lays ahead. You don't want to not be a Christian. You don't want to leave, but you don't really want to be a Christian. You ever got yourself into that position? You're like, well, I ain't going to the world. I know that ain't the place I want to be. 
But it's wholehearted, full commitment. I don't want that either. You know, your dreams can turn into a nightmare when you're half-hearted. I think there's actually no worse place to be than in God's kingdom when you have a hard or half heart. Yeah. Yeah. We've all been there and it's a horrible feeling. Yeah. Terah went back to worship other false gods. See, the place that he moved to had false gods. They, were, they weren't the true God, but I think maybe because they were different gods, he went, well, let me try these. And do you see that? People go, well, I'm done with the old church I came from. I know that's not the truth. Then you show them the truth. They go, well, that sounds right. But let me just go and check out another church to see if, you know, maybe that will do. Because they're just not that committed. Come on. You know, Jesus says, Luke 14, 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. If a church doesn't teach that you have to give up everything, it's not a true church. It's as simple as that. And how many churches really demand you give up everything? In actual fact, most you go to are trying to teach you why you shouldn't have to give up everything. That's why they're attractive. However, you end up living a worthless life in the eyes of God. In 2 Kings 17, verse 40, it says... But they would not listen and were stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust in their Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statues he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. You know, Terah died neither in the city of his ancestors nor in the place of the promised land. His bones and his soul never found peace. They died between the pain of his past and the promise of paradise. Having started with great intentions, he ended up living a worthless life. You know, life is like going up a down escalator. I say this all the time. You're trying to go up a down escalator. If you stop, you go to the bottom. If you stop growing spiritually, stop pursuing to become like Jesus, you will end up where you were before you even started trying. You know, Terah died never reaching the promised land in a, in a place called Haran. As all characters with the Bible, we're meant to read them and learn from them. So why did God put him in there? Why is this whole section on him? Why not just go, hey, Abraham had a dad? Because we're meant to learn from him. And even in the gospel, Jesus refers to this type of heart. One that starts with great intention, but gets distracted along the way. In Mark 4, in the parable of so, in Mark 4, 18, it says, Still others see, like seeds sown among the thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. It says this is the same thing. People become Christians. They come in the church. They start with great zeal. But then they want the dream of the world and Christianity. And you know how you can tell? They don't bear fruit. They find reasons not to evangelize, not to study the Bible with people, and they don't bear fruit. People go, well, I'm I'm not distracted. It's easy to tell. You don't bear fruit. If you don't bear fruit, you are distracted. Well, I don't feel like I'm distracted. Feelings are deceitful. God judges you and will give you fruit if you're not distracted. So point number one. Again, all the titles are the same with all the great characters. Why is Abraham in the hall of faith? Now, why is he in the Hall of Faith for the first time? Because he's in a couple of times. So we're just going to focus in on this part of why he's in the Hall of Faith. Well, basically, it's simple as this. When God called, Abraham went. And I know that sounds really, really simple. But if you think about it, how many people are called by God and simply don't go? They say the hardest step on a journey is the first one. The hardest step for that marathon was getting people to run the first mile, MJ, wasn't it? Amen. <laughs> Wherever you are. Now she's like, hey, we're up to six next week. I'm like, wow. But actually, it was more about getting it to actually turn up the first day. It wasn't that she couldn't do it. It was that she felt like she couldn't do it. But she's cranking, man. Yeah. 
There you go. Changing her life. Okay. One step at a time. Okay, that's a song or something. Anyway. Genesis 12, verse 1. So we're going to read, it says, I'm going to do verse 1 and verse 4 and 5. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to a land I will show you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. That's where his father had settled. He took his wife, Sarai, and his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. They arrived there. Now, when God called Abram, there were many, many reasons and excuses he could have given for not obeying. How about his age? Let's just be real. You're 75. God, let's be honest, mate. You should have called me when I was 21. <laughs> or sometimes we go, okay, I could do it, but you're really going to expect my wife? I mean, look how old and frail she is. Are you really going to expect her to do something radical at her age? What about his responsibilities? I can't leave because I've got responsibilities. It's amazing how many people we study the Bible with that have responsibilities in a church that they know is wrong. Right. And they go, I can't leave because I've got responsibilities. Yeah. You have a responsibility to teach them to leave. His friends, the fact that he had an established life, the fact that he'd already left the city of Ur, I mean, wasn't that enough? It's amazing you hear Leslie sharing, you know, haven't I done enough? God, for goodness sake. Don't you see what I've already done? You know, God has a very short memory, which we really, really appreciate when it comes to our sin. <laughs> but when it comes to our achievements, we want him to remember them a lot. He just has a very short memory. Let's just take it there. You can't have one without the other. You know, what about the fact, the sentimentality? Look, my dad's buried here. Come on, my dad is buried here. Yet despite all these potential reasons and excuses, Abraham obeyed and went. Why? Because of who was asking. God. There is no one in the world that has a right to ask you to give up everything except for God. It's as simple as that. No minister can command it of you. No friend can command it of you. Even your spouse and your children can't command it of you. Because they're sinful and they have no right. But God has every right. God is the creator and sustainer of our life. We exist and wake every day because God allows it. Karen and I were talking this week, I forget who it is. But somebody said, they asked him like, you know, how do you feel today? It's a good day, I woke up. You know, the older you get, that's the more you, you get, hey, I... They work. It's a good day. I can see you. But as a young person, we can forget that. You know, we are his to do with as he wishes. Once we grasp that, it is so much easier to surrender to his will for our life. Because there really is no other choice. You see, God will do with you whatever he wants to, whether you like it or not. You will die when he wants you to die. And you will live if he wishes you to live. Once you actually surrender, that life becomes so much easier. Yeah. It's like you're in a river and you're trying to get back upstream and the water keeps hitting you. That's what it's like going against God. But if you just go, you know what? I'm going to turn around and go in the direction that the river's going. It's like the will of God. I'm just going to turn around and go in the direction. Yeah, I've got to avoid a few boulders, but hey, I just got a free pass to Disneyland. Forget what... <laughs> You know, Leo's dad wants to give me. I'm in there, baby. Okay. The other thing is, Abraham went based on a promise of an inheritance that he did not see. You know, we live in a world that wants everything now. The youth of today feel entitled. I actually think the youth of every generation felt entitled. Why? Well, you've got the prodigal son. So 2,000 years ago, the prodigal son felt entitled. So I don't think there's been much change between 2,000 years ago and today. But the concept of waiting for an inheritance, it's like, I don't want to do that. I want it now. It's amazing. Once you give people a credit card, they go, I'm going to buy what I want now. I'm going to have the dress I want now. I'm going to have the car I want now. I'm going to live as if I've earned this stuff, but I haven't. This concept of waiting, of patience, is incredible. See, 
God didn't actually show him what he was promised. He just said, I'm going to give it to you. Trust me. You know, this is faith. Faith that is ready for an adventure. Going into the unknown. And we all love the old Star Trek. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Ooh. Yeah. Then we go. How about you get on the starship? No, nah, that's okay. I'll watch the starship go. That's how we want to be. You know, being happy every day to wait on God to give you what he wants to when he wants to you and believe that because it is who God is, it will always work out. One of my favorite verses, it goes into a lot of my sermons, 1 John 4, 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us, God is love. Remember, Abraham is one of our founders of our faith. Why? Because he goes, he just went willingly. Faith and risk go together. No one ever did anything great without vision. It's vision that enables you to overcome the challenges of today. If you're here as a student, you go, I can envisage myself getting a degree, getting a master's, getting a PhD. It is having that vision that makes you actually stay in the library at one o'clock in the morning and go, I'm going to get this done. You don't see the certificate. In actual fact, most people lose their certificate at some point in their life. They go, but I know I've got a degree. A few of you are laughing there, Pete. I can see that. <laughs> All right. But it's that I know. And that's the same with God. I know what God promised me. Abraham was given a vision of a future that would have changed the world. Yet we live our life based on that same vision as Christians. You know, and then Abraham went even though he did not know where he was going. Again, we live in a world where everybody wants to know the end of the story as you start the beginning. How many of you have bought a book and read the last three pages before you've started the beginning? I want to know how it ends. Or you're sitting there with a friend and you know, you're watching a movie and then the hero suddenly disappears and, and his captain go, does he come out, does he come out, does he come out? I'm always like, will you shut up and watch the movie? But some of us is like, tell me, is, is that okay? Hey, it's the first episode in 20 series. Okay, I think he survives. But the reason that we want to know where we're going is because we don't trust. Your lack of trust may be stemmed in your parents, in your friends, in your education, in your country. But it's based not on God. You've got to understand this. The world doesn't want you to trust. It wants you to fear. The economy that we live in is based on fear. It's based on fear. Buy life insurance because you might die. Yeah. Let me just tell you, you will die. <laughs> okay? Guarantee. Buy car insurance. Make the best of the car insurance. Buy this. Buy this gadget because it will protect you. Buy this gadget. And by the way, those masks for coronavirus, they will not protect you from the virus. Yeah. But that's not what it says on the packet. Okay. People lie. The world lies. The world needs you to live in fear to fuel its materialistic economy. Satan wants you to be consumed with fear so you will have no emotional room for God. Fear is the opposite to faith. And faith is the opposite to fear. Abraham was at peace to live without a plan. Without a map, to his destination. This goes against everything our insecure nature, our worldly friends, and our family tell us to do. They go, if you become a Christian, what's going to happen? I don't know. If you go on a mission team, what's going to happen? I don't know. That's just stupid. I know. <laughs> if you don't believe in God. See, Abraham trusted that if God had a crazy plan for his life, then God would know how to execute that plan. God would provide everything for Abraham and his family as long as he was willing to go. You see, sometimes we try and take on God's job, which is to figure everything out. That's not our job. Our job is to have a willing heart. 
2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As much as God says you need to give up everything, God says, I will give you all things. With God, it's an all or nothing deal. You either give him everything and get everything or give him half heart and get nothing. It's as simple as that. Point two, how did Abraham change a nation? This is really interesting because we've started out Noah who built a boat. Okay, People went around, they did things. Abraham changed the nation because he was willing to be used by God. It wasn't the first time he was in the hall of faith. It wasn't because of what he did. It was because of what he allowed God to do to him. Genesis 12, 12 says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be blessed. It's all about God. Did you notice that? Genesis 17, 8. The whole land of Canaan where you are residing as a foreigner, foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you and I will be their God. See, a man from a backwater town became a nation. The nation of Israel that occupied uh, Canaan because he was willing to have a life used by God for God's purposes. You know, if you are willing to be used by God, incredible things can happen. The issue with most people is they're simply not willing. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. The issue is not can God use you and do great things, the issue is, are you willing to be used? Abraham was patient towards God's blessings. He knew it would take time, years, decades. Yet he was still willing to let God, through time, deliver his promise and mold his dream through him. Abraham did not see the reality of his promise until he became 100 years old. Some of you think the best years are behind you. The best years are absolutely in front of you. Genesis 21, 2, it says, Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. See, we want everything now. Give it to me now, God. I want a child now. How many people have left God because they didn't get pregnant before they were 30 or 35 or 40 or 45? I want it now because everybody else is getting their promise now. God says, I will give it to you when I want to give it to you. You know, of note, the only time that Abraham was impatient with God, and impatience is a lack of love. So 1 Corinthians 4, 13, 4 says, love is patient. So when we are not patient with God, we are unloving towards God. The only time he was, he sinned, slept with his slave girl Hagar at his wife Sarah's suggestion in Genesis 16, which led to the birth of Ishmael, whose descendants have become enemies of God's chosen nation, the disciples, to this day. Genesis 16, 11. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. And the descendants of Ishmael have been against the Jews and the Christians since their existence. Because he wasn't patient. You know, Abraham was willingly let God make him into many nations. So first of all, he said, hey, I'm going to make you into a nation. Then he said, you know what, you're doing such a good job, Abraham. I'm going to make you not into just one nation. I'm going to make you into many nations. And in Genesis 17:4 and then 10:14. 10 and 14, it says, God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram, but I will call you Abraham, for I've made you the father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep, every male among you shall be circumcised. Any circumcised, uncircumcised, uh, any uncircumcised male 
who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So God made a covenant with Abraham that included circumcision. This is not something that you have to do. It's something you have to allow God to do to you. In this again, we see Abraham was made into many nations because he was willing to allow God to cut off part of him that was incredibly personal. To be used by God, you must allow God access to the most personal parts of your life and let him cut off you anything that he does not desire in your life. You must be willing to let God in and let him hurt you. Only then will he know that you truly trust him. You know, God was looking to establish a nation and then many nations that were willing to allow God to use them however he thought best. To not be willing was to be considered outside God's love and protection. You know, this heart of God was all the way through the Old Testament and in the New. And people go, well, I don't have to do that. I go, you've missed the point. God wants you to do that. I think about Timothy in Acts 16.1. Timothy had a Greek father uh, and a uh, Greek father, a Jewish mother. Jewish mother, yeah. And Paul wanted to use him to go and preach to the Jews. So he said, you know, in order to do that, I need you to be circumcised. Not to, so that you will be saved, but so that you will be more effective in saving others. See, once you become a Christian, you can't become more of a Christian. Once you're saved, you can't become more saved. The only thing you can do is become more effective at saving others. Come on. And this is the same heart. It's, are you willing to be used? Are you willing to change? You know, so often people get into fight. I don't need to do that. You don't have the heart of a disciple. Right. The heart of a disciple is this. What do I need to do to save as many as possible? I don't need to do this. I don't need to be special or get a job or do this. Hey, you know what? When we look at your life, it's not a great example for non-Christians. I don't need to get out of bed early. You won't, you won't get any top student following you into the gospel unless your grades are good. You won't. You won't. Your example's not good. If you're lazy and get out of bed late, people won't become Christian. They go, I don't respect you. Well, I don't need to raise up early in the morning and pray in the morning. I can pray at four in the afternoon to be saved. You have missed the point of being a disciple. You know, Abraham then changed all nations for all time. It's amazing, this guy from a backwater town who had a father that was lukewarm ended up changing the world to this very day. In Genesis 12, 2, it says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Talk about being under the protection of God. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. You know, the far-reaching consequences of Abraham's decision to respond to God's calling and be molded are still being felt today. In me, in you, why? Because Jesus Christ was a direct descendant of Abraham. You know, in Matthew 1, verses 1 to 17, it goes through the genealogy of the Messiah. And in Matthew 1, 17, it says, Therefore there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. No Abraham, no Jesus. We think our decisions have such small ripples. You become a Christian. You're a powerful Christian. You stay a Christian. It will affect your children your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, it can affect a complete and utter nation. You know, today, disciples are a holy nation created by the faithful decisions of Abraham and Christ's sacrifice. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. The same calling that Abraham received is the same calling everybody in this room and everybody in this world is receiving today. So point three, how can we imitate Abraham's faith today? Come on. Well, you can respond to God's initial call by becoming a Christian. 
You know, when I became a Christian, I had absolutely no idea how God would use my life. Yet it's been amazing. It was such a great personal struggle to become a Christian. You know, I did not realize that God was the revolution I was looking for. Nearly every person you meet goes, I want a different life. But when you present them that that life is found in God, they go, that is not the revolution I want. You know, Mark 1.17 said, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for men. All the dreams that I had thought about, about achieving, were off the television, were off a book. The only reason I didn't have God's dream in my life was because I wasn't reading the Bible. That's why it was such a shock to me. You know, the number of people from other nations I've had the privilege to help become disciples simply by opening my mouth and evangelizing. The first person I ever met, I remember as a young Christian going, I haven't got a clue how to evangelize. I don't know what on earth I'm doing. Just walking up the street and I was taken to Camden Town in London and I walked up this guy and he said, hey, I want to invite you to church to talk to you about God. He said, I'm a Christian. I said, you going to church? He said, no. He said, come along. His name was Bruce McPherson. He was from Lo an architect from Los Angeles. And I remember I hadn't got a clue what I was doing studying the Bible. So I brought in one of the other leaders and he studied and I took notes and I was eager and I prayed with him and everything. And Bruce became a Christian. I was like, I know I was maybe three months old as a Christian. I was like, oh my goodness, it works. <laughs> Going on the street, overcoming timidity, and then studying the Bible people. It worked. I mean, there was just this shock that it actually worked. We see every other church I'd ever been involved in said it didn't work. They said, that's not how you do it. And I, was just, I still remember, you know what? When we moved to Los Angeles, 25 years later, I met up with my own personal fruit. He took us out, he took us to the Hollywood Bowl, paid for the picnic and everything. I didn't know that was gonna happen when I was evangelizing Camden. I was like, man, met his wife, met his kids, went round for dinner. I was like, this is just amazing. All because I decided to give up my selfishness and learn to evangelize. You know, I would hate to think where I would be today if I had not responded to the call. I've seen the lives of nearly all of my friends, family, work colleagues, full of divorce, addiction, bitterness, fear. Some are dead with no hope of salvation. I've had many different people in my life that are me, that are not a Christian. My old boss came, was born in the, roughly the same city I was born in in England. Roughly the same age, I think there was a year's difference. Character-wise, you'd have gone, you guys are like brothers. People would go, you guys are just like brothers. And it was almost like God gave me a manager that goes, Joe, this is who you would have been if you weren't a Christian. On his third marriage. Successful, wealthy, nice house. But inside, it wasn't going well. And I think that's the amazing thing to me. I think I've just got to continually thank God for what he has rescued me from. No one would ever have known of Abraham if he hadn't responded that day and gone, you know what, God, it may seem like, sound like a crazy idea, but I'm going to do it. You know, the second thing we can do is respond to God's call to become a leader. I think this is one of the, the failings of Christianity. Because most Christianity that is preached is really preached from a selfish, selfish point of view. Because here they go, go, it's just about you being saved. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's a little bit of it. It's about God using you for your in your life to do what he wants. Being saved is like a bonus. It's a given. It's like, you're saved, great, what do you do? Fantastic. It's like an hospital. You go to a hospital where all the babies are being born. All right? And there's those being waiting to give birth and those afterwards. The midwife goes in, yeah, they're the people that are about to give birth. Those are the people that have. It's what I do. It's just what happens in life. The real issue is, is what's going to happen to those babies in their life. That's the real issue. You know, to be a Christian, to be Christ-like, is to be a leader. Why? Jesus Christ was a leader. Jesus did not live a life to pursue self-happiness, but to create national and global happiness through preaching the gospel, which is the good news. I can think of no more selfish thing for a man to do 
than to know the truth and not spend his life evangelizing. Imagine this. Imagine Elias, because he works at the university and deals with sort of chemicals and all sorts of things like that, found the cure for the coronavirus. Imagine he did that this week. And he went, you know, I'm not going to tell anyone. I just, I'm insecure. I, I'm not a people person. I just, I feel uncomfortable taking the glory of finding it. And I, after all, nobody would believe me. And the virus goes on and it kills millions of people. And three years later, it's found out that he has suppressed what he has found. Would people view him as a good man or an evil man? Absolutely evil. When people claim to be Christians and they don't spend their life evangelizing and saving others, that's exactly how God will view them. You had the power to save and you were selfish. You know, I think about my calls into leadership. You know, after I became a Christian, I'll be honest, I thought this was fantastic, great. And I wasn't very popular at school, surprise, surprise. And so I wasn't like the club captain or anything like this. And then all of a sudden, the more I prayed, the more I evangelized, people went, wow, you're pretty awesome. I went, I like this feeling. And then they stopped me in leadership because then I was, you know, you, you get in this encouragement, go, okay, if that's what I'm going to get praised for, I'm going to do it more. So I went into leadership and they said, good Bible talk leaders, go out and evangelize lots and bring lots of people to church. So that's what I did. And I did love people and I did love God, but there was also this selfish ambition going on underneath. The problem with that is, because that took me into the ministry and I was asked to go in the ministry. When you are fueled by selfish ambition and not the love for God, you will be crushed inside. That's why I'm so hard lying on it now. Not because I started off pure hearted, but because I know the damage it did to my soul. Because you're trying to impact the world in a spiritual way without being spiritual. You can't do it. It's like trying to drive a car on treacle. You go, well, hey, yeah, there's a little bit of petrol left inside, so maybe it goes for a couple of miles, and then the whole thing breaks. And I remember coming out. I thought, well, I had the right notion, but I didn't have the right heart. Then the second time, you know, I was given a Bible discussion three years after I became a Christian. So I went in the ministry after a year, came out, and I was given this ragtag Bible discussion of six people, including me. And I looked at it and I went, not good. Not good. It was, in the, it was in the equivalent of Mount Druitt in Sydney. It was a place called Handsworth in England. If any of you ever lived in England, this is where the yard is, where the Jamaicans are that smuggle the drugs. Okay. And I didn't know. I was just a sort of ignorant you know, country boy, and two doors down, I made friends with this garage. I later found out that they were the, some of the drug lords, and I was their, mini, you know, token minister, because I used to bring them cups of tea. I'm mean, totally oblivious to all of this. And apparently, that's why we had protection, because these guys, that's our minister. You don't, you don't touch that minister. <laughs> and we suddenly re re didn't realize why we got so many visitors, you know, because they're like, you want to go along to that boy's church, you know. This. So I was this white boy in this Jamaican community, and, but God blessed it in an incredible way. And I got a vision. I go, you know, uh, uh, the thing was, because I'd come out of the ministry, I'd come out of leadership, uh, and I wasn't doing very well, and I'd been emotional. I thought, oh, stuff all this. So I was very verbal about my emotion and everything. I was a bit like, you know, a leper in within the own church. So none of the sisters, well, actually, the sisters were told not to date me. They went, he a bit messed up. Give him a few years. Okay. <laughs> then I found out about that. I was not happy. Okay. As you can tell. Okay. But what it allowed me to do was, it allowed me just to focus on, okay, I know what's right, people don't believe in me, the sisters don't like me, so all I've got is God. <laughs> that was true anyway, I just hadn't realized it. And it was my time of really experimenting. I remember praying for six hours one day and recording, how does this make me feel? Then the next day, I, I didn't pray, I went, how does this make me feel? Pretty bad. I ain't doing that again. Okay. No, what I did, I actually didn't pray for three days. I, want, I, I thought, I really need to master my relationship with God. And yet, I got called and called, and I knew I had the talents, but these talents needed to be broken and molded and broken and molded and broken and molded. And it was a painful experience. But then God used us incredibly within that church. We rose up. We were, I was asked to go back in the ministry in London. I met Kerry. We came back. We ended up leading that church, leading six other churches around Europe. 
uh, around uh, England, etc. And I was back in leadership until 2003, where it all got smashed. And then many of you know the story, but I was left in Portland with Kerry, no church, came out the ministry, got back into the world. Um, and the movement was starting again, and I visited the conference in 2006 in Portland. And I went back the next year on my own because we couldn't, uh, had to look after kids and stuff. And I remember being called by God. I remember it. And I'm not an emotional, charismatic guy. I do not. Hallelujah, I felt God move me to have a cup of tea, not a cup of coffee this morning. That is not who I am. I am English. Although I'm changing, I am English, okay? And I remember preaching. And sometimes, you know, when, when you're studying the Bible with somebody and the, the verses are coursing through you, you study it with someone and you go, I'm being a hypocrite. I don't know if that's the actual spirit speaking to you, your conscience speaking to you. All I know is when I was doing it, it was true. Whether it was the Holy Spirit convicted me or what. And I remember preaching on prayer going, we need to save the world. I remember walking out of this sermon and going, I need to leave Australia, move my family to Portland to train to go and lead England and rebuild the church there. I remember going and praying going, no. I remember having this argument with God and hard in my heart going, I will not do it. I've given enough. I've given enough. And I knew it. You go, well, how do you know? When you are called by God, you know. Like people go, how do you know if you're in love? Well, you're not in love because when you're in love, you know. <laughs> how do you know when you're called by God? Believe me, if you are ever called by God in that way, you will know. There will be no doubt. It's not what I think God called me. You know. And that's why I look at Abraham. He knew. He, he knew when God called you, you know. But I remember refusing. Went back, tried to start the church in, in uh, Brisbane, built a bigger house, tried to succeed in business. God bless me with that, did I, or allowed me to see the futility of that. And yet, I studied the Bible with this guy called Adam. And uh, so we're trying to build the church in Brisbane. I'm doing discipleship with him. I'm going, okay, so you're just here for three months, and then you're going back to um, Newcastle, <laughs> But there's no true church there. And we literally sat and we looked up every church in Newcastle. And we phoned them for their doctrine. We literally did. I, I was that diligent. Every church. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? No. And I did it with him. You see, so there's no true church that believes the true doctrine. He said, you can't go back. He goes, I, I don't have the faith to do that. Because there are only five of us. And when you need to do it. And I remember that night or the night after just being so convicted that I was such a hypocrite. That I called a man to give up everything when I hadn't. I found up Kipper said, I've made an enormous mistake. What do I do? To pack your bags and come. See, you can resist the calling of God for so long. But it will haunt you for the rest of your life. Also, many people don't understand the consequences of not being called into leadership. In Judges 9, verse 8, there's a little known parable that talks about if you have the talent to be in leadership and you refuse it, how it will hurt you. In Judges 9, 8, it says, One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves. But they said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, Should I give up my oil by which both gods and humans are honored? to hold sway over the trees. Next the tree said to the fig tree, come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, come and be our king. But the vine answered, should I give up my wine which cheers both gods and humans to hold sway over the trees? Finally the tree said to the thorn bush, come and be our king. The thorn bush said to the trees, if you really want to anoint me king over you, Come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. The talented were called. And they said, I'm not going into leadership. I want to use my talents and be successful in the world. I've got degrees. I've got this, man. I want to be a Christian, but I also want to be powerful in business. That's right. Let me tell you what's going to happen. Those people that are willing to go in leadership but don't have your talents, are going to end up leading. But they don't have your talents, so they've got thorns. So for the rest of your life, you either won't put yourself on a thorn bush and you will fall away and leave God, or you need to subject yourself to people whose social skills are limited and will continually hurt you, which will make you bitter 
and you will be tempted to leave God because you'll look at God's leadership and goes, why isn't he calling better people into leadership? Doesn't God know? He does, and he's looking at you. But I don't want to give up my worldly dream. My parents expect this from me. They expect this from me. It's not about what your family expect. It's about what God expects. And the third thing we can do is respond to God's call by becoming a foreign missionary. Abraham was the first missionary. He was. He was the first missionary to go to a foreign land, to Canaan. You know, what are the ripples of being called to a foreign mission team? You go, I, I, I want to go to this place where I feel called because I relate to those people. It doesn't work like that. God wants to be on it. He doesn't want you to be on it. You know, I want to lift up Pete, who came to Australia, and go through the life of his story and show you Abraham in his life. So, Pete is not Australian in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Okay. He may be a bit now, but okay. Come on, mate. He often sat opposite me in the first year and went, we are a very unlikely couple, buddy. I am of a different origin than you. I come from Oakland. You are a middle-class toffee Englishman. He didn't say he was much nicer than that, but I knew what he meant. But Pete was willing, like Abraham. He didn't know what he was doing. He was willing to go on a mission team. He was willing to learn to do the website. As a result of building the website, Themis came to church. Pete did not invite her. He gave God the opportunity to be used. Themis, who is our sister in Hong Kong now, then brought her friend Candice to church, who became a Christian, who brought her friend Jess to come to church, who then started, the three of them, the Hong Kong mission team. Themis then was evangelizing, and because she was willing, she was evangelizing with Leslie, Audrey walked up to them and said, hey, you look like willing people, can I become a member of your church? She now leads Themis by leading the Hong Kong church. What did they do? They did nothing. God did everything. They were just willing. Because of that website, Liz came to church. She just rocked up one day and went, hey, this is where it is. Could Pete take some claim for that? Well, in some ways, but it was God. Right. It was God. And so, Jesse, you need to really give Pete a hug afterwards, okay? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> As a result of that, Lennox and Kira were going to go to church, but got up late. Looked online for a church, walked into our church, and went, this is the church I've been looking for. I preached on Acts 22, repentance and baptism, forgiveness of sins. I went up and said, what do you think? He goes, I've been looking for a church that teaches repentance and baptism, forgiveness of sins. I went, really? <laughs> I have never heard that in 20 years. And you know his history. As a result of Pete's willingness, well, who was with Themis when Audrey was met? It was Leslie, because she was willing. She was willing to go and start the Parramatta Church that has its first baptism today because she was willing. You know, Sean and Eric Venezuela came on the mission team. They were willing, and again, two Americans. They were chosen because they were sporty. Uh, they're good looking. I don't know about sporty being the operative word. They were thin and good looking. I'll give them that. But Sean has gone on to lead a new nation, lead our church in New Zealand. His brother Eric went on a missionary again from Sydney to Hong Kong and then to our church in Samoa. And I believe he met the first person that was baptized in the Samoa church. And I've been to Samoa and seen the doctrines. I believe that sister was the first ever true disciple on Samoa. God threw in a nice, you know, he secured his wife on the beaches of Samoa. And that was a pretty, you know, because God likes to bless us. Why? Because they were willing. Too often, we focus on the step after being willing. What have I got to do with God? But if you start to try and do things for God when you are not willing, you get burnt out. You get hurt. You really do. When I helped MJ and many of the people start to run the marathon, the first thing I had to figure out is, are you willing? Once you set your mind to, I am going to, then you actually figure everything else out. 
You figure out the shoes you need to wear. You figure out the music you need to listen to. It's the willingness that you need to deal with. You know, to respond like Abraham, to have faith like Abraham, is first of all to become a Christian. It's then to become a leader. And it's then to go on and be a missionary. So we were asking the young Christians part last night, how do I become a missionary? Pick a city. Get a bunch of people. Let's go. You know, I actually think that Alistair's, maybe that's our conference title for two years. Let's go. You know what I mean? Like that. Let's just plant 10 mission teams. Let's go. Do you know what I mean? But in conclusion, Abraham, the faith to respond to God's call. Why is Abraham in the fall of, hall of faith? Well, you might equate it to he became a Christian. Obviously, you're not following of Christ, but everything pointed to Christ. If you're here today as a non-Christian, that's how you can start. How did Abraham change the nation? We are talking about him over 4,000 years later. How many human human beings can that be set off? And how can we imitate Abraham's faith today? Well, I'm going to leave you with a poem, but Jackie's about to get baptized. Why? Because Pete came. Through Pete, Leslie was made. Leslie went to Parramatta and the gang. And he's going to get baptized today. But I'll leave you with a poem. Not mine, I've stolen it. You know all the good things I steal. It says, shall I spend the days of my youth in pride and leaving no longing for life denied? Shall I heap to myself an earthly treasure and worship before the throne of pleasure? Ambition and hope and life are mine and dreams as bright as the stars that shine. With empty glamour the world allures, the devil beckons, the flesh conjures. Shall I choose my heart Sorry, shall I close my heart to the God of truth and leave him out of my years of youth? Then when I've wasted away the best, return to the Father and offer him the rest. A shattered vessel a few short years, a life made bitter by selfish fears. Seeing God so loved that he gave us his all, shall I give less when I hear his call? Oh no, Lord Jesus, while I am young, to teach your word I will give my tongue. My feet to follow where you shall lead. My hands to labor for you indeed. And all ambition my heart has known, I yield to you to be yours alone. The plans that selfishly I have made with hopes and dreams are before you laid. A faithful steward I long to be over my talent entrusted me. That when I face the eternal son and he sees his fruit, he may say, well done. Oh, take my heart, my life, my all. I have heard your voice. I have met your call. Amen.